at this time to move on to the, the first session uh, that will actually be about uh, ensuring sustainability of the European Universities Initiative at, in particular, the European level, and in particular after 2023, 2023 being actually more or less the time uh, when the, the first alliances will finish their first cycle of three years. And I'm very delighted to welcome the first uh, speaker in the session, uh, and as well as the second speakers. Uh, second speaker. So the first speaker will be uh, Professor Peter Mattison, who is the Vice uh, Chancellor and Principal of the University of Edinburgh, uh, and representing Una Europa. And we can also see the second speaker, Professor Patrick Prendergast, the President and Provost of Trinity College Dublin, also representing the Alliance Charm EU. I should mention that the Coimbra Group is an associated partner to these two alliances. And we will first start uh, with the first speaker. So, Peter, it is up to you. And the title of your presentation is The Post-Corona Crisis, a Momentum for Constructing the Una Europa Virtual Campus on the sides of education, research, and societal engagement. So, Peter, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I was just waiting for somebody to unmute me. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, Yes, Ludwig, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity, and it's a great pleasure for me to represent uh, uh, Uno Europa in uh, in this meeting. Um, so, uh, as you uh, as you know, and as you've heard, the concept of European universities uh, was uh, a pre-coronavirus phenomenon. We're going to date everything I think that we talk about to before and after coronavirus, but. Um, the the notion of uh, a European alliance uh, university alliances uh, came. Uh, last year, and when the University of Edinburgh uh, was considering uh, this call, we were very keen to be members of an alliance. We had opportunities to join several alliances, and in the end, we we jo we joined Una Europa partly because of the, uh, the the relationships that we already had with some of the uh, member universities, and partly because we thought that the agenda that was being discussed by Una Europa was particularly imaginative. All of that was pre-corona, um, but all of it is still very much true post-corona. And as, as uh, Sophia said earlier on, I think there's a sense in which the uh, the momentum behind these alliances has actually been accelerated by coronavirus. And so we may be able to see this as something of a, a silver lining. Um, so could I have the next slide, please? Um, the uh, the new brand for, sorry, just go back to the previous with that one. The, the new brand for uh, Una Europa was actually launched only on Monday. So you're seeing it very early. Uh, this is the uh, this is the the, the, the logo of, of Uni Europa and the um, uh, the the list at the bottom of the slide is the is the member universities um, and uh, you'll notice that uh, a significant proportion of them are um, uh, Coimbra uh, Group members. Um, so the um, uh, the next slide, please, uh, shows uh, this. Uh, membership in more detail. So there are eight universities in eight different countries, uh, and the universities speak nine different languages. The reason that there are nine languages is because the University of Helsinki is a bilingual university. Uh, and so there are nine languages spoken by these eight universities, and you can see we're dispersed right across uh, Europe. Now, um, I have to use the Brexit word. I apologize for that, but um, part of the thinking of the University of Edinburgh in wishing to join one of these alliances was that at the time we were contemplating the, e the UK's decision to leave the EU and we were conscious that we wanted to maintain the strength of our relationships with a number of these European partners and indeed our international outlook more generally. And so there were many reasons for joining uh, one of these alliances, but Brexit mitigation was certainly uh, one of them. Uh, so you can see the, the, uh, the membership there. And the next slide, please. So the mission and the objectives of uh, Uni Europa are outlined uh, here, and the, um, the, the, uh, the list will be familiar to, uh, to, to those uh, members of the Coimbra Group that are part of this alliance, and, and indeed the Coimbra Group itself is, a, is a, um, an associate member of the alliance. Um, but we're working together to create a university of the future, which we see as a continent-wide uh, university for all of, our, all of our activities in teaching research and innovation. Uh, we envisage bringing graduates for the future with 
uh, really extraordinary uh, international European international experience uh, through uh, the the collaborations that we've set up and using the latest pedagogy and tools which will be used to support learning uh, in the future so if I can have the next slide please um, thank you so the, the 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 next slide just refers really to the um, uh, to the acceleration of by coronavirus that I've already referred to um, and I'll have the next slide as well please um, and I wanted to talk about uh, one particular example of the uh, of the uh, the collaboration that's going on through Una Europa and this is around um, research and the particularly the the this topic of one health now what we mean by one health is the uh, the linkages between human health and uh, animal health. And obviously, illnesses like COVID-19 are examples of what's called zoonoses. So they're illnesses which uh, start in animals and transfer to humans, and they are uh, previously unknown to humans, and so therefore they have a devastating effect on, on human health. And the linkage between animal health and human health is something that we in Edinburgh have always been very conscious of. We have uh, one of the top vet schools in uh, Europe and we have a lot of work in collaboration between the vet school and the the medical school dealing with human beings and, and also with social science and economics and various other aspects of public policy. So the concept of thinking about health as one phenomenon that's not separated into animals and humans is something that we're quite familiar with and it's become very topical for the world now as it thinks about uh, COVID-19 and the possibility of other zoonoses. Uh, so we believe that uh, bringing this subject uh, to the uh, the activities of Uni Europa will be a way of joining up multiple uh, skills, multiple uh, disciplines across a group of uh, research intensive universities. And we think that this will enable us to uh, to to address not just the uh, the pandemic and, and similar pandemics, but other uh, 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 big research questions which require multidisciplinary and multinational uh, approaches. We don't believe that uh, research can be, uh, sorry, if you just go back to the previous slide for me, um, I don't, we don't believe that research can be unidimensional. It needs to be uh, uh, multidisciplinary and, uh, and, and crossing national boundaries. Um, and then the next slide, the same, the same is true, of course, for education. Um, uh, we, we believe that there are tremendous advantages, advantages to uh, our students for uh, the collaboration with uh, universities speaking other languages and existing in other countries. This has been complicated by coronavirus because we were originally thinking about mobility between our campuses uh, with the idea that being that a student might study a common degree program, but they may study it in a different language and they may study it in two or three of the eight universities rather than in just one or in all eight, but some subset of the universities. This has become uh, practically more difficult with the limitations on travel that have come with coronavirus and we hope that those are temporary but what it's allowed us to do is to think about how can we provide international experience and international mobility to our students in an era when physical travel is going to be more difficult more dangerous and more restricted by public health uh, guidelines uh, and so um, we are imagining ways in which our, our universities can share classes can share experiences outside the classroom and can give our students a taste of uh, another national, another language discipline uh, without actually physically being able to travel there. The, the ultimate extension of this will be to have joint teaching units and joint assessments and working towards the notion of a common European degree that you heard uh, Sophia mention earlier on. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Sophia kindly mentioned uh, the hackathon that, uh, that UNA Europa has, has, has recently uh, run. This was called uh, UNA 10, and the slide that's showing here is a picture from the Edinburgh students' uh, contribution to this, in which they were working on uh, trying to devise a safe, uh, socially distanced way of experiencing a visit to a museum. And this was done together with the uh, the Talbot Rice Museum in, uh, in Edinburgh, which is an art museum attached to the University of Talbot Rice Gallery. Um, student uh, teams from uh, seven of the eight Uni Europa universities work together in this hackathon, and the, uh, the team from Edinburgh is now working with the mayor of the city of Helsinki, who showed some interest in applying some of the thoughts that they'd had about this, uh, this 
gallery visit uh, in safe circumstances to some of the solutions in uh, in Finland in response to the need to change practices after um, uh, after coronavirus. So Una 10 featured uh, more than 100 students, more than 20 coaches, 19 teams addressing four challenges, um, including involvement of the European Commission Joint Research Center and a number of uh, local stakeholders. And there are lots of student videos on YouTube that uh, you can see if you want to uh, find out more about some of the uh, challenges they were addressing and some of the uh, theories and, and solutions that they came up with. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, in the longer term, these are the ways we're thinking. So we're thinking about joint bachelor degrees where partners will build a, a very similar curricula, obviously delivered in different languages. I mentioned at the beginning that there are nine languages spoken in these eight universities. And in the uh, early stages of our thinking, again, pre-coronavirus, but accelerated now, we had two focus areas that we were thinking about, uh, a bachelor's in European studies and a bachelor's in sustainability. And uh, the plans for these uh, um, uh, programs and the uh, removal of red tape, which Sophia mentioned earlier on, uh, it, it are well advanced. And, and this has been a particularly imaginative part of the discussions that UNA Europa has been having. Um, we also think there is a scope for micro-credentials at master's level so that, that students can um, uh, study for um, a, a, a part of a master's degree by tr with transferable micro-credentials. And again, the pilot subject in which we, we see that working is going to be in sustainability. And ultimately a joint doctorate, we're thinking in terms of cultural heritage, where here a, a joint doctoral title, which would be recognized in all the uh, partner countries, uh, would be the desired outcome. And so we're thinking of all levels of uh, education and research in terms of collaborative uh, activity leading to collaborative degrees. Um, this really is just the beginning. These are just the seeds of some ideas. Um, we're very much turning our mind to future sustainability. How can we think about um, uh, making sure that these initiatives uh, outlive the current funding? I was very pleased to hear that uh, Sophia mentioned uh, thinking about sustainable funding for these networks in the new MMF. Uh, MFF, that's very welcome. Um, we're also thinking that collaborative research applications and, and teaching applications will be very attractive to funding agencies, and we hope to find a number of ways of making these initiatives uh, sustainable. With that, Ludovic, I'll, I'll stop, but thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Peter, for, for this presentation from Una Europa. I suggest that we immediately uh, move to the second speaker, and then we'll, you will come back with us with the, for the, the, the part on question and answers, if you, if you agree. So then it is my pleasure to uh, give you the floor, uh, Patrick, uh, from uh, TCD and representing Charm EU. And the title of your presentation is The Future of European Universities Initiative at European Level After 2023, The Differing Perspectives on Sustainability. Patrick, please. Thank you very much, Ludwig. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I hope everyone is well. Um, I'm, as Ludwig has said, uh, President and Provost of Trinity College Dublin, and I hold a, a number of other positions that might be relevant. I've been on the governing board of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology since 2012. I'm also president of the engineering uh, program Unitech, and I am chair of the board of Science Gallery International which brings eight universities worldwide, including several in Europe, together uh, for uh, science engagement activities. I want to talk about the viability and sustainability of the European Universities Alliances, and with particular reference to the alliance that my university is in, uh, CHARM EU. European Universities Alliances has the potential to be as pioneering uh, as Erasmus and the framework programs in uh, terms of spearheading pan-European higher education, research and innovation. We want to get students, uh, professors, innovators uh, moving around the regions of Europe in work and research and study in as frictionless a way as they do around the United States, for instance. And it won't happen automatically. It needs visionary and enabling initiatives. And I believe the European Universities Alliance is such an initiative. Uh, like the University of Edinburgh, as Peter has said, I was also very keen for Trinity College Dublin to be involved in this, so I was delighted. Last summer, when Charm EU was chosen as one of the 17 in our world European Universities Alliances. As you can see, and can you please go back because I want to, you've gone on ahead of me in the slides. 
Now go forward, go back. Um, the uh, logo there uh, describes what Charm EU is. It stands for Challenge-Driven, Accessible, Research-Based, Mobile European University. And the next slide, the alliances of five universities, uh, Trinity College Dublin and the universities of Barcelona, Montpellier, Utrecht, Edforst, and Elta in uh, Budapest. And we have Ruhr West University of Applied Sciences as an associate partner, as well as several other companies and agencies and networks, uh, including uh, the Quimber Group, and as uh, given there on that slide. Now, challenge driven is the concept that we're familiar with. Now, you can go back, you don't need to go on. I'll tell you when to go ahead. Challenge driven is a concept that we're familiar with for research. Uh, but I think we're less familiar with it for education. And the aim in challenge-driven education is to put students in the driving seat of their own learning, to solve challenges rather than to learn uh, about disciplines. Next slide there. The broad area of challenge represented by Charm EU is to reconcile humanity with the planet. That's large scale and interdisciplinary as befits challenge driven education and research. Think of uh, COVID-19, the current pandemic we're in. Addressing that pandemic is a medical challenge, obviously, but it's also, as we've seen, a political challenge. It's an economic challenge. Financial, mental health, societal behavior are all involved in solving that challenge. And in the 21st century, we have to ask, can we address, can we educate students to be challenge-centered? How might they address the challenges of reconciling humanity with the planet? Our expectation is that they will look at options across the participating universities in Charm EU and select for themselves the relevant programs and modules. In Trinity College Dublin, they might choose a module in our new engineering Environment and Emerging Technologies Institute. For Utrecht, they might take a module in marine science. From Barcelona, a program in sociology, and so on. The idea is for students to create bespoke curricula for themselves. Their goal is not to know everything about one discipline, but to learn to use many disciplines to solve issues confronting humanity and the planet. Charm you is innovative on a number of levels. Firstly, we're setting questions around education and skills. Can challenge-driven education work? Can students and professors move beyond the disciplinary approach? Are professors willing to deliver this kind of education and are employers ready to take on the graduates? Secondly, we're setting questions around partnership and around collaboration. Can European universities work together in a, as a single institution? Uh, and can that be enabled by new modes of governance? Can we cross barriers of different cultures? And different cultures spawn different kinds of regulations. So we have to cross those barriers too to successfully deliver an innovative and relevant curriculum. All 17 European university alliances are addressing issues of partnership and collaboration. And for the alliances to be sustained, the answers to these questions must be yes. We must be able to solve questions relating to uh, governance and collaboration. There are days as yet. At this pilot stage of the project, we're looking to establish viability and sustainability. Charm EU has organized around nine work packages led by the University of Barcelona, and they're shown here on this slide. It's a next slide, complicated slide that I, I won't go through, but um, I want you to see it here. The core activities of these work packages are, first, the creation of an innovative governance and management model, and second, of a curriculum which addresses the ambition of reconciling humanity with the planet and the curriculum that incorporates transdisciplinarity and challenge-based learning with student mobility and inclusivity. The key outputs we're looking for are also given there. A sound working governance and management model. A toolkit that will share resources and artifacts of the project 
among current and future European Universities Alliances, and materials and content for a master's degree that will run from 2021, uh, involving all uh, CHARM EU partners in a single uh, university arrangement. We will complete the work packages in three years' time, 2023. They will help us determine the viability and sustainability of CHARM EU and of the Un European University Alliances. We, the participating universities, we believe in the relevance and importance of challenge-driven education and in collaborating to deliver our mission to reconcile humanity with the planet through education and research. We're staking our belief on that this approach is the way forward for 21st century education. The onus is on us to create a high-level, well-organized initiative. But we need to do so in tandem with students and employers. And uh, you can put up the next slide, please, which is given here. We're trying to do something new. We're trying to give students greater autonomy in building their curricula. And we're asking employers to try out this new approach. We will best succeed if we involve all partners from the start and remain student-centered and employer-centered. Focusing on the relevance and attractiveness, we will also secure our financial viability. I recognize higher education as both a public good and a private good. So my preference is for students to pay for the charm at EU masters, underpinned by national and our EU support. Our experience in Trinity is that students uh, will pay for a program if it's sufficiently attractive. Uh, and that if it's attractive, students will see it as an investment. We have some programs like this. A standout program is our Bachelors in Arts with Columbia University in New York. Participating students pay the high US fees for a two year program. And the demand for this among EU students cannot keep up with supply. Students will pay for quality. Uh, can we place a high value on Charm EU? I think we can. And I think doing so will force us to face issues of financial sustainability. However, I understand people's concerns around tuition fees and I applaud strong state investment in higher education. So whether it's the participating countries and the EU that bears the costs or the students themselves, the remit remains the same. Financial sustainability derives from the program having first and foremost quality and relevance. States and students should only invest in excellence. If we can build something students and employers want to invest in, this will help build momentum and impetus around the creation of a European education area. Let me close with some thoughts on the European education area. To date, this has been more an aspiration than an act of policy. We've made significant advances in the European education area through Horizon 2020, and the ERC, but when it comes to enrolling students, designing curricula and conferring degrees, there haven't been much significant pan-European advances since Erasmus. It will take political will for this, um, uh, and we need national governments to be flexible and creative. European Universities Alliances do provide a structured framework, incentivized and supported by the European Commission for universities to demonstrate that we can successfully innovate. And my, I finish with a quote from a, an Irishman that the whole world thinks is French, and that is Samuel Beckett. And uh, Samuel Beckett was a, a student here in Trinity College. He was one of our first exchange students, and maybe not, not the best example, because he went on an exchange to Paris and he didn't come back. <laughs> he stayed there. Maybe it's good for European literature and world literature that he did. But Samuel Beckett said, and I quote, let us do something while we have the chance, it is not every day that we are needed. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this uh, brilliant presentation. I would like to invite uh, Peter Mattison to join us again so that we can uh, uh, discuss a little bit and reflect further on the, the two presentations so far on uh, the two alliances, uh, Una Europa and Charmi EU. Uh, maybe uh, I would like to recall that uh, the audience has the possibility to ask questions through the, the chat. Uh, of the of the webinar uh, system, uh, but maybe uh, while we wait for for, for those questions, uh, let me uh, start by asking, um, and if you could respond uh, in, in short, of course, for for the matter of time, um, what would you see as the the, the immediate impact of the COVID nineteen on your alliance? both positive and negative and for instance can you also elaborate on how the students responded in this uh, challenge maybe asking first to, to peter then patrick thank you very much ludovic i mean as i had mentioned in some of my slides i mean i think we clearly there are many very negative uh, aspects of coronavirus and its impact on our ability to provide the best possible uh, education for our students and the best possible environment for research but i would like to concentrate on the positives I think um, uh, some of the imaginative thoughts that we'd already had about um, creating shared programs and making the alliance uh, greater than the sum of its parts, I think have actually been accelerated by coronavirus. Um, it has meant that we can't do what we were originally planning to do, which was a lot of it was based around mobility. But in some ways, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that actually by doing some of these things digitally, we make them even more versatile. We make them accessible to more people. Um, Clearly, it brings uh, challenges of its own. We've, we've been trying to address this thing that we call digital poverty, where some students don't have access to either the devices or maybe the broadband or, or, or Wi-Fi signal. Uh, and there are ways in which we can address that. Maybe try and make heart, make very uh, conscious efforts that this doesn't leave anybody out. But, but subject to that, I think actually this can be seen as a positive. I think what it's made me feel, I mean, I'm certainly very happy that the University of Edinburgh uh, had the opportunity to join one of these alliances, made the decision to do so, and then was successful in the application because I think it's put us in a very strong position. And I know that a number of other UK universities are now wondering why they didn't participate. Uh, in the first in the first round, there were only three uh, UK universities that were part of successful applications, um, and I'm very happy that Edinburgh is one of them. Um, so I, I think actually I'm trying to see this as a silver lining of the pandemic that it's accelerated us in our ability to get support and backing uh, to do some of the things that we were planning to do anyway. And, and, and hopefully it will be even quicker and even more successful as a result of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Patrick, your opinion? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Peter has said, and I, I won't repeat any of his points other than that I agree with him. For us, uh, I suppose the idea behind our uh, Charm EU is challenge-based and reaffirmed our view that challenge-based education is something for the future where we work across disciplines and allow students to decide challenges like others could be other than the pandemic, uh, inequality, uh, climate change, issues regarding to uh, environment and so on. The second thing perhaps in a separate point is the Europeanness of, uh, of where we are kind of has become come to the fore in the pandemic. The fact that there is so much mobility in Europe and how important it is to us all, and not just for tourism, but for education as well. We've had uh, quite some discussions here about how our university would continue with Erasmus and um, some universities in Ireland have said they won't allow their students to go on Erasmus but we've decided we will allow them to go on Erasmus such was their, their uh, push to be allowed to continue to participate in exchange programs so I just make those two points okay uh, we we have actually we are receiving a lot of questions from the audience i'm trying to to sort of uh, pack them all into uh, into a package um uh, so so very quickly a few a few questions further to you um we have seen in the uh, keynote speech from uh, sofia Eriksson that the european commission is indeed planning uh, some sort of uh, long term potential support to the uh, alliances, hopefully. Uh, what, in your opinion, would be needed to accelerate the process and the progress of, of the alliances? And, 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 and another uh, viewpoint from you expected on um, what uh, future statute should be given to the alliances to support their sustainability? I don't know who wants to, to start. Paddy, why don't you go first? Please. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, it, it will. It's becoming clear, I think, uh, that across Europe, the funding um, uh, modes are such are so diverse that some ground level funding will be required to maintain uh, financial sustainability in the long run. As I said in my few words there, of course, it's no point in providing financial sustainability for something the students don't want. So the first and most important thing to guarantee sustainability is that these are valuable and seem to be valuable by both students and employers. But that being said, uh, to uh, make it po possible for many families and individuals to participate, there will need to be uh, funding of some kind uh, provided from the public purse, in addition to what might, might, might or might not be available privately. Then uh, it would be very interesting actually to look at governance modalities around Europe and whether or not there would be some common ground that the 17 uh, inaugural uh, European Universities Alliances share some common problems that can have a regulatory common solution at European level. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would, all I would add, I mean, I, I agree with that. I would just add that I think we, um, the challenge to us is to make our applications irresistible. I think you know, we have the opportunity to pull uh, massive strengths from across organizations, and this should put us in a very strong position to compete. Um, we don't have any divine right to funding. We don't think we can't expect special treatment. We, we have to uh, focus on excellence and make sure that we're really, really strong. Um, I agree with Bally that there needs to be some infrastructure funding. And, and one thing I didn't say in my presentation, but we've tended to think in terms of using relatively small amounts of money to pump prime activities, because sometimes with a small amount of funding, you can get something going and get it to a point where it's then ready for a broader funding application. And I think the more we can do that, the more we will, uh, we will achieve sustainability uh, of our networks. But I think the bottom line is we know that we have uh, individual capability as institutions we have to prove that these linkages make us even stronger and even better able to address the problems that the funding agencies want us to address. Mm -hmm. do, do you already see in your alliances uh, a sort of internal uh, already preference for your researchers and teachers to work within the alliance or do you still have uh, cooperation with other uh, previous partners and, and, and similar to this, do you also already see the need to cooperate between alliances? Uh, well, shall I go first? The, the, I mean, the um, I don't know how it is at Trinity College Dublin, but I I, I can't tell my researchers what to do. Um, uh, I I, uh, I can give them opportunities, um, but uh, these things only succeed if people want to work with other partners. And one of the reasons behind our choice of joining Uno Europa was that we already had a number of successful bilateral relationships with some of those partners, and so it was there was already activity that we could build upon. Um, I do think that uh, universities uh, will, will uh, university leaders can't, as I say, they can't force people to work together, but they can provide opportunities, they can, they can, they can create uh, openings, and then I think it's a question of encouraging our colleagues to get together and talk about where there's areas of shared interest. Um, we must not be exclusive, so this certainly doesn't stop us from collaborating with anybody else, um, and it certainly doesn't mean that um, uh, we would have any special favours for uh, an another member of Uno Europa, but but uh, only in the sense that we already had links with them and we want to see those continue. And there are areas of complementarity that we think really make very good sense. Your point about collaborating with other uh, U European university alliances, I think this is really important. I think if this initiative is going to succeed, then uh, they can't just be one set of one alliance that just goes off on its own way. There's got to be some kind of common goals. And from what I've read of the other alliances and indeed listening to Paddy just now, there's a lot in common between some of the some of the shared ambitions and everything. So. It makes absolute sense for us to work uh, together and not in any kind of uh, not not allow any kind of barriers. Mm -hmm. Equibra Group is here to help, of course. Patrick, of course. your views? Yeah, oh, uh, I think Peter has uh, hit the nail exactly on the head. Uh, this um, is not uh, designed to replace Charming U, not to replace, but to build on and have a particularly strong alliance with some uh, universities, but to continue with our. Uh, multiple collaborations on many other fronts, including outside of Europe. And I agree with the point, uh, you know, you can't, can't uh, tell, you don't want to have professors who are easily told what to do. Uh, you want the professors who, who, who uh, when persuaded that something is the right thing to do, will put their shoulder behind it. And that's what we see with uh, Charmy.
Okay, thank you very much, Peter and Patrick. Unfortunately, we could continue the discussion, of course, but we have to move on uh, with the other speakers. So thank you again for joining us, and we will have other opportunities, of course, to continue to, to discuss on this very interesting topic.